Pam McCarthy. I am the Vice President of Vermont Coalition for Disability Rights, and my day job is the head of Vermont Family Network, as um, many of you know. I'm really, really grateful to see everybody today, and um, at the front end, we wanted to um, say that, you know, this is our annual Board of Governors meeting that happens in the summer. We also have one in December. Um, we meet uh, pretty much monthly, and during the session, we meet every couple of weeks to talk about legislative issues and other um, important pieces for people who have disabilities and their family members. We are a strong group. We are supported by the Developmental Disabilities Council in part. Um, we've been in existence for a really long time. Ed probably knows how many years because he's he's been one of the primary people here forever. Um, and we welcome new members. So I want to encourage you if you're not a member organization or an individual who's interested in this group, um, check out our website and the process for getting involved or contact Karen Lafayette, our coordinator directly. Um, we would love to have you uh, more formally engaged if you choose to be. This opportunity today is in place of what normally would be a face-to-face -face meeting. And um, we're just really grateful that so many people could attend in this virtual format. So some housekeeping things before we get started. Um, we did mention the renaming. If your name is not correct on your video box, you can go up to the right hand corner. You should see three little dots and rename is an option. So you can do that and be your own self, which would be great. Um, you can keep your video camera on throughout. We're really happy to see everybody. But if you would remain on mute from the little microphone that's in the corner, unless you're speaking, we'd really appreciate it so that we don't get distracted with background noise. Um, when you do speak, we'd love it if you could say your name as you do. There are so many boxes. Sometimes it's hard to figure out who is speaking. And we do have interpreters who are working with us today um, who are trying to capture what we're saying. And I find myself speaking too quickly, too, so I apologize for that. Um, I, I'm regretful to say that um, our Zoom captioning is not working today. So we do have um, a stream text link. and. Unfortunately, as I said, there are no captions in the Zoom itself, so much apology. We want to ask that people will hold their questions until our question and answer period at the end, for which we hope to have at least 20 minutes. Um, and if something comes to you in the course of the meeting and you just got to get it out there to, in order to be able to remember it, which I often do, please use the, the chat box. And Stephanie is gonna gather those questions and the ones we have time for, we will answer at the end. Those we either don't have time for or don't have the answers to, we will get back to you as soon as we possibly can. So I wanted to let you know that. Also wanted to say that um, the documents that are part of this meeting today and the recording itself are going to be available on the VCDR website fairly soon after this meeting. Thank goodness for Stephanie, who's kind of in charge of that. So I appreciate it. Um, I think the only other thing we wanted to mention is that we do have an opening for the secretary of um, our, our steering committee. Uh, we would welcome anybody who's interested in stepping up to the plate around that to let us know. We're not doing elections today, but if you're interested, please contact us and we'd love to talk to you about that as a VCDR member organization. So I'm thinking I got all the housekeeping details. Karen, you can give me the signal if I did not. <laughs> so moving forward up. Oh, thank you very much. I'm getting an A-OK. -okay. So um, I wanted to take a moment to remember Goldie Watson, um, who has been a longtime member of the Coalition for Disability Rights and um, someone who's been an essential advocate around disability for a really long time. Unfortunately, we got news from the Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health that Goldie passed away on um, July 6th. So if we could take a moment of silence just to remember Goldie, we would really appreciate it. I thank you for that. We are going to miss her quite a lot. So next on our agenda is our wonderful commissioner of the Department for Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living, otherwise known as Dale. 
our own Monica Hutt, and I would like to let Monica have an opportunity to share some updates and some other information related to COVID and Dale. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Great. Um, so I will just say that Sarah asked me to do this, and she started with 15 minutes, and then I kept getting chunked down to less and less minutes. Thank you, Karen Lafayette. Um, <laughs> so now I technically have 10 minutes and I have um, a lot I wanted to just talk about. So, so I'm going to just jump in. I'm going to probably talk really fast. I'll be on until three. So if there are questions for me, um, we can, I can try to answer those when we get to the question and answer period. But Sarah asked that I talk a little bit about what Dale is doing through this whole pandemic. So I wanted to do that a little bit. I think there's been a lot that's happened and I have my notes on the other screen, so I'm gonna look back and forth, but um, it's been pretty extensive at Dale in terms of our response to COVID-19 and this whole pandemic um, and pretty consuming over the last few months. And it's definitely impacted all five of our divisions in really different ways. So just as a reminder for folks, because some of you connect to different divisions, we've got the Developmental Disability Services Division. We have our Adult Services Division. So all of our Choices for Care program, our Traumatic Brain Injury Unit are part of that division. We have the Voc Rehab and the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired and then the division for licensing and protection. So licensing of all of our residential facilities and the adult protective services um, are both part of that division of licensing and protection. So in each division, there have been kind of disruptions to our normal work. Um, in every single one of those divisions, people have had to learn to work in slightly different ways. Dale staff have been remote since probably mid-March. So we are, like all of you, connecting with one another over Zoom, over telephone, haven't been in the building in a really long time. And that's true of Waterbury and all of our district offices as well. So that's been a huge learning piece for us. Um, we've had to collaborate with all of our partners, our community providers, um, in really interesting, creative ways while communicating remotely. So that's been a big learning curve, um, but we are certainly grateful for those partnerships across the state. Um, and I will be honest and say that some of the work that we were engaged in, the things that we were trying to get done as part of our normal day-to-day -day business have been put a little bit on the shelf because we had to really kick into gear in terms of an emergency response. And I know that that's true for all of you, um, but it's been something that we've been trying to navigate. So rather than kind of talking about really specific things that Dale has been doing, I wanted to talk to you about kind of the big buckets and give a couple of examples in each of those big buckets, but you know, not get into the deep details. I also want to talk to you about what I think is coming around the corner, you know, kind of the things that I'm starting to think about and I'm a little bit worried about or maybe maybe a little enthusiastic about, we'll, we'll see. Um, and hopefully, and it sounds like it will be more at the end, but, but um, because I don't get to talk to all of you in one, one place at one time, be just really interested um, in taking the opportunity to hear back from you. Every time I do one of these meetings, I really like to hear what people are thinking because it's always different from spot to spot. Um, and it's important that we all keep collecting that information, myself and anyone at Dale. So let me just kind of start with, with some of those big buckets. You know, one of the things that I keep hearing, and you all have heard a million times as well, is that this pandemic is like nothing we've ever experienced before. And one of the things that we all are doing, myself, the department, all of you, is, is kind of continuing to learn how this virus works, what it's doing, how it moves, how it's transmitted, how it impacts people, what our responsibilities are to kind of manage it. And just keeping up with that information is a little bit, um, is a little daunting, to be honest with you. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to keep saying, which I say to my staff all the time, is that it's really important for us to, to take a moment and remember that even if you're not experiencing the virus itself, we are all experiencing the impacts of it. You know, being isolated from each other, being a little bit disconnected, 
maybe a little bit anxious. Um, it's frustrating that our rate relationships have been kind of um, derailed or disjointed. I mean, I, I've been with my family in my house for a really long time. I love my family. Um, we could all use some space from one another, you know, and I expect that that's true across the board um, and even more true if, you know, you are used to a different level of service. If you're, if you're used to being out and about and aren't getting that, um, that's really impactful. Um, so I just I hope that people are taking time to acknowledge that however you're feeling is how you're feeling. And that's really, um, it's important to pay attention to right, as we keep moving through this, because things are changing, but they're changing pretty slowly. Um, our work at Dale is about kind of our unique systems, um, and everybody's working in their own arena. Sometimes we connect and sometimes we don't, but the, the impact of how we're all feeling is really pretty global. So when I think about the big buckets for Dale, there are three that I want to just focus on today. The first is really supporting the Vermonters who, who get services and supports through Dale. So I know that there are a lot of Vermonters and, and, and we are all responsible for different groups of those Vermonters. But for us at Dale, we've been really trying to focus on those folks that get services and supports through us. So that's a big tenant, a big um, bucket of the work that we've been trying to do. So in developmental services, we focused a lot on price, like trying to create some ways to find dollars to give crisis payments out to families. You know, we tried to be flexible about converting dollars that were, were in people's service plans for one thing, saying you can use this in a little bit of a different way. Um, we did that in Choices for Care too. How if you're not getting the services you are typically um, used to getting, can we kind of convert those services into something else so that we can support families and individuals where they're at right now while they can't access their services? Um, we expanded the eligibility for Meals on Wheels, which seems like a really simple thing, but really taking all of the rules out of that for a little while, we tried to push Meals on Wheels out to as many people as possible, both older people in Vermont and partnering with VSIL to folks with disabilities across the state. So we tried to do some of that flexibility, really focused on supporting people. A lot of the policies that we have around services, we tried to be flexible with so that you could get supports and Medicaid could pay for supports that you might get on the phone, that you might get over video. Um, so those kind of flexibilities really aimed at continuing to support people have been a big component of the work that we've done. Um, and we've also tried to do some concrete things. So I know that just last week, we got cloth masks out to several different organizations, VSIL, I think the Federation, maybe the network, certainly to VCP, um, to push cloth masks out for any individual who hasn't been able to access them already. Tried to get PPE out to our providers. In fact, we created one person in Dale who was kind of the PPE specialist in an organization that was having trouble getting that through the state uh, emergency center could go through our own Melanie Federson um, and get some help with getting deliveries of PPE. We've had Dale staff that have literally loaded up their cars and driven around the state to push equipment like that out because we wanted to be able to be concrete in our supports. Um, we've also had some pretty exciting things happen in the middle of all this, putting together a visor card um, for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing so that they could keep them in their cars and communicate more easily with the police. So some of these things that we've tried to do have been concrete as well. The second big bucket is trying to support the providers um, that provide services through Dale, um, through the department to Vermonters. I'm sorry, I may be using acronyms, so I will try to be really clear about that. I'm seeing that come up in the chat, so I'll be careful about that. But all of the service providers that, that the department partners with, so everybody from your designated agencies and specialized service agencies to the area agencies on aging to home health to some of the senior centers out there. We've been working with all of them in a lot of different ways. And to start with, you know, just making sure that they had guidance from us and from the Department of Health about how to provide services safely. Um, in a lot of instances, that hasn't been able to happen, and we're just slowly getting back into that. 
right? But, but there was some guidance that we were able to put out right at the very beginning about some services that were essential and needed to keep happening and, and where people might be able to pull back a little bit and might have to pull back. Um, there's also been a lot of focus on making sure that our providers stay financially stable, right? Because we couldn't come out of this pandemic into a world where, where places had to shut down because they didn't have the dollars to support themselves through all of this kind of chaos. So that's been a big part of the work that we've done. I will tell you that through this pandemic, two different adult day providers ended up closing, not because of COVID-19, but it put an additional little bit of pressure on them. So we lost an adult day program in the Barrie area, and we lost an adult day program in the Rutland area. And we will be working with those communities to see if we can put those back online for folks. Not everybody takes advantage of adult day programs, but it is certainly one piece of the puzzle out there in service delivery. We wanna make sure that we're not losing providers rapidly like that because it really has an impact on communities. There's been support for the workforce too in terms of supporting them with hazard pay and there's been a new, uh, there's a new bill that just passed the legislature that's going to enable more providers to apply for that hazard pay for their employees. Um, and that even extends to our independent support workers that are paid through ARIS. So there's been a tremendous amount of work around our provider community, making sure that we can come back to them as this pandemic kind of eases and services can restart. And then the biggest bucket probably of all has been all that we've tried to do. Oh, I'm already over by two minutes. Sorry, Pam. Um, I'll wrap up really quick. Um, but keeping homes stable. So a lot of the work that we did with Vermonters themselves, with our providers, have been to try to make sure that people's housing stays stable. And that looks really different depending on where you're housed, whether you're in a residential care facility or a nursing home or in a home you're on your own. Um, there's been a, a ton of work, not all of it um, perfect, but all of it really aimed at kind of stabilizing. So just really quickly, I know I'm over time, but I'm gonna just tell you the things that I'm worried about or I think are coming around the corner and we can talk about them more at the end. Um, I think getting, getting ourselves restarted and reopened, getting back to normal service delivery, whatever normal looks like as we get back to it, but I think that that's really coming around the corner um, and helping our organizations to do that safely, helping everyone that's in services feel safe about that. Lots of policies that have changed or are being impacted by this. So I think really paying attention to, hey, we're able to do a lot more over the telephone and video. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Is that more flexibility and we should really be supporting that? Where is that not good? Where is it good? And how do we make sure that we can keep paying for it if somebody wants that? Um, there's also some really funky policy impacts of all of that federal unemployment on Medicaid for working people with disabilities and eligibility there. So we're trying to work with legal aid to make sure that that doesn't um, rebound in a way on folks that is negative. Um, th this is the opportunity to maybe change some services and how we provide services and we wanna take advantage of that. Um, and I frankly am really worried about what happens in the fall and are we gonna see a resurgence in this virus? So how do we plan for that? How do we make sure that we are intentional in what we're doing now so that we don't have to backtrack too much in the fall. So I will pause there. Like I said, I'll be on until three and hopefully we can chat a little bit more. Thanks, Pam. Thank you so much, Commissioner Hutt. I wish we did not have such a packed agenda today and I'm sorry to hurry you along. So next up, um, we have Deborah Lisi Baker, who is going to present um, some really important results of a survey that the Coalition for Disability Rights has conducted rather recently um, to understand better the impact of COVID-19 upon people with disabilities and their families in the state of Vermont. Hi, everyone. This, I appreciate the opportunity to be with everyone. And I want to see, can everyone see the the slide uh, on the screen. I've never given a uh, PowerPoint presentation via Zoom, so I'm, it's a learning curve. Um, but I wanted to um, just say a couple things first, and that is um, Sarah Launderville put together this slide based on a, to the compilation of survey results from a survey that we sent out to Vermonters with disabilities and, and their families. And um, 
we we want to make sure that people everyone should have gotten a copy of this survey and um, we you can as I'm speaking, if you have comments or thoughts you don't want to lose or questions you want to remember to bring up at the end of the meeting when we're taking comments and questions, you can put them in your chat. But we've also put VCDR's email address at the end of the PowerPoint. So if after this meeting you're looking at this PowerPoint or thinking about the conversation today and you decide that you want to you have a follow-up question or comment and would or would like to have an update on the information from the survey um, we would welcome hearing from you and right now we're still accepting uh, people are still filling out the survey so this is sort of a point in time presentation of our findings to date um, so far 97 people have filled out the survey and 76 percent identified as having a disability and um, or, or, um, or being deaf and 51 percent identified as being a family member of, of a person who has a disability or is deaf and so if there you can see there's overlap there are many of us who are, are both have disability experience ourselves but also are family members we had 62 people who were a women replied uh, 28 men and one non-binary woman I'm not getting my my survey doesn't want to move on the screen. There it goes. Oh. So when we were thinking of the survey, one thing we really wanted to know, and it sort of follows up on Monica's comments, is we wanted to know whether people were getting the services that they needed and the supports and resources they needed, whether they were able to have a community connections and 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 be. Um, be in connection with people. And um, we also had some questions around um, employment issues. So we asked these um, questions to better be prepare as advocates for being able to support people with disabilities, people who are deaf and family members, um, and to know where the gaps are and where we might need to really plan ahead in order to make communication or contacting and being in human contact with people while physically distancing work. So um, I'm just going to summarize some of these things. I won't say go over everything on the slides, but I want to get some of the key points. Um, and first, we asked if people were able, to, if they had enough food. And um, two, almost 3% said they didn't. And almost 14% said that there, there were times when they did not have enough food to eat. So that was an important piece of information for us. We also asked if people were able to access the resources that they needed. And uh, almost 20% said they're not able to access all the resources they needed. So we did ask some questions later to find out more. Um, we, uh, fortunately, 100% of the respondents who responded to the survey at this time did have a place to live. In terms of their um, connections with others, we asked um, how often people were able to make face-to-face -face contact with someone had it um, during a time when we're doing so much physical distancing. And there were uh, over 7% of the people did not have any face-to-face -face contact um, with others. And over uh, almost 60% uh, had face-to-face -face contact uh, more than five times a week, and others varied um, between that. Um, you know, we wanted, we asked how, how many times a week people were able to have meaningful telephone conversations with someone, and uh, seven, 16 percent of the respondents said that they had no meaningful phone contact with people during the week, and um, 26, almost 27% said that they had meaning, meaningful contact more than five times a week and others also had uh, various level of contact with people. Um, in a scale of, we, we asked people, because in Vermont we've been really concerned about whether people are able to access information and resources through the internet. And so we asked how reliable internet access for them was for everyone responding. And overall, people said that their reliability was 7.7 uh, .7 on a scale where 10 is excellent. So that gives you a sense of internet reliability. Um, 
Um, it was interesting, 91%, uh, 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 almost 92% said that they uh, use email or social media and 8% said that they didn't. Um, so again, that's useful in terms of thinking about how we make communication work for all people um, as this pandemic continues. Um, and we asked people how often they used email or social media to contact with and connect with others. 63, almost 64% said that they made daily contact. And on the other end of the spectrum, um, 8% said they never used email or social media to connect with others. And um, we asked how many, whether the individuals responding used virtual meeting platforms like the one we're using today, Zoom, to connect with others. Again, important for planning um, for the future in terms of how we're sure we can make sure that communication and meetings and education um, are accessible to everyone. And um, uh, twenty four percent of the participants in the survey said that they don't use a virtual meeting platform and a little over seventy three percent said they did. Um, we asked people for a range of whether uh, whether they had access to internet TV landline phones cell phones and smartphones and and uh, computers and laptops, and that information is there for you to review. And we asked how comfortable they were using um, different uh, forms of uh, communication. And um, from the inter internet, social media, smartphone, tablets, and computers, and you can see um, the, the range um, from the internet is the high. People seem to be most comfortable with, with the internet, and that's it. 8.3 percent in a in a scale where 10 is excellent and uh, very comfortable and um, the lowest was uh, using um, a tablet and social media and those were at this in the six point range i can't see the chat so if people are sending me comments i'll have to look after and reply um, now this was um, the next thing we were asked for is is how if uh, people use developmental or mental health services and 47 of the respondents um, said that they did and of those 47 respondents they told us um, what kind of uh, contact, what, who they were contacting and working with. And 23% said they were working with case manager. And 59.5% uh, 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 said they were working with a, a therapist or a psychiatrist or a psychologist. And 38% said they were working, they were getting, receiving some kind of peer support. Um, and um, and 2.4%. 40% said that they, they would love to have a regular connection, but they don't. Um, when we asked them how they were connecting, they gave a range of responses relating to online phone, in person, or no connection. And they still seemed rather low percentages. Uh, for example, the online response was 11% and the phone was 7.68%, almost 8%. In person was 3% and no connection at all was less than uh, 1%. So um, we don't have background on that anymore, but we may have as we compile more of the narrative comments people gave. Um, now, one thing, of course, that people are always concerned about both now for everybody in Vermont, but also for people with disabilities is the issue of employment. So we asked people if they lost paid work because of the pandemic, and about 23% said that they did. Um, and we asked people if they lost employment supports during the pandemic, and uh, um, almost 12% said that they did. Um, we asked what steps employers have taken to help people be safe since the pandemic began. And um, you'll see that people gave a lot of narrative comments as well, which they're there for you to look at. But they did say that 44.45% have been able to work remotely. Um, uh, about 17% were given personal protective equipment. Um, 
of about 14% were not able to work because of the pandemic. So they have lost out on work opportunities. And, and, and then another 14% said that they, um, they weren't able to work even prior to the pandemic. And again, there were some really interesting comments about um, both things that were working well around employment supports and protections and, and things that people were concerned about, which you can review. Um, we asked people, because we've been hearing a lot at VCDR meetings when we talked about what people with disabilities and families were telling us about um, living in this pandemic, um, whether they were having a hard time accessing benefits. And most people said no, but some of the issues that came up was issues with the hospital and uh, needing advocates to help get it resolved, harder to access benefits fits because of lack of mobility and transportation, the, the strain of the unemployment offices being overwhelmed or computer problems there, um, and uh, um, fear that their benefits will be cut or having a difficulty getting their, their being able to use their, their card for getting groceries online and difficulty getting medications. And we expect to see more comments as we continue to um, go through the survey results for their narrative comments. Other comments that people made were probably not surprising to anybody on this call, on this uh, in this meeting. The transportation, the need for care, the, the challenging getting caregiving support, computer access, the challenges getting testing for the virus, uh, again need for food, and a big big capital letter isolation. People really feeling, um, as Pam said at the beginning, we're all feeling the isolation. Um, and, uh, and, and on the other side of, in terms of the positives, that it's been wonderful for people who've been able to work at home um, during this time when they can't go to an office. We, we wanted to take the opportunity since we are reaching out to people, something, a couple things we were passionate, we we're all passionate about it in the Vermont Coalition for Disability Rights. We wanted to know how many people were registered to vote and we're happy to we were happy to learn that 88.5% of the people who responded are um, registered to vote. And uh, we, we hope that that number will continue to grow. Um, and also um, we asked if people have completed the census and 87.5% of the uh, people who did the survey said that they have completed the census. So again, we really encourage you both in the chat section for this meeting today and also afterwards through our, our email address to stay in touch. Let us know if you have any thoughts about this survey or any questions or comments as you look back through the PowerPoint that Sarah had put together for us. And I thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you. Thank you so much, Deborah. That's really enlightening information. And I know that we are planning on utilizing this as we think about what our legislative work should be going forward this year. And we certainly welcome feedback from people and questions when we get to the end of the meeting, if you should have them. So thanks so much for presenting that. And thanks to Sarah and Absentia for helping put this together. We are really, really lucky to have her leadership around it. So that's a good segue to the next section of our agenda, which is around legislative wrap up for the year that has just closed almost because we know the legislators are coming back to finish the budget in August, but um, that and advocacy. So I'd like to introduce Karen Lafayette as our VCDR coordinator to speak first. Um, I will, thanks Pam. I will be uh, very brief. I'm going to let uh, Julie Earhart and Marilyn kind of uh, talk about some of the important details for people with disabilities that the legislature did address. Uh, but basically the legislature, since COVID uh, came, came to pass, um, they have met remotely for the past 15, 16 weeks. The majority of their work has been, pass, uh, has been to pass a quarter, uh, one budget. So for three months of the budget um, for fiscal year 2021, um, they did that. Um, <clears throat> Um, and then they passed uh, a number of bills that spend the federal assistance coronavirus relief fund money uh, uh, to help um, uh, state agencies, local government, business, uh, K through 12 education, state colleges, nonprofits, housing, human services, and individuals affected by COVID. Um, they spent over $1 billion in coronavirus relief funds 
Um, they, they have been allocated to the legislature. The governor also uh, had the chance to allocate some of the money. Um, they held back a little bit, a couple hundred million um, to help with what's coming uh, in, in, um, um, in, for the rest of the budget. Um, the coronavirus relief fund monies uh, could not be used to supplant or, or to replace our lost revenues, and they have to be spent by December 30th. So that is a pretty large restriction. <clears throat> but the legislature did address many of the issues you just heard about in the survey. Um, they also passed a number of, of policy bills, including health care regulations, um, excess use of force by police, um, elections and voting by mail, climate change, special education, and other. So um, Julie and Earhart and Marilyn are going to talk about some of those specific things that happened in the legislature related to those, those issues that we're interested in. So I'm going to pass it on to Julie Tesler from Vermont Care Partners. Thank you, Karen. Um, one of the things I miss about in the in-person legislative work is working directly with Karen um, and Earhart and others. Um, but through the co uh, Vermont Care Partners, let me just introduce, is um, the trade association and a nonprofit provider network that supports designated and specialized service agencies around Vermont that provide mental health, developmental disability, substance use disorder services, and a few other services along the way. Um, so yeah, the COVID pandemic has had a huge effect on our ability to meet the needs of people. We um, greatly appreciate the partnerships we've had with um, state government in doing that. The flexibility um, that they've provided for us has been amazing. Um, also, our staff have worked really hard. Their commitment to meeting the needs of the people we serve is very, very strong. Um, and they've been just working very hard. There actually was an agency who asked staff to nominate each other, who, had, you know, other staff who had worked, done, done heroic work, and they got 300 and something nominations because everybody is working really hard to, to continue services. Um, that said, people's needs are increasing, and they seem to be increasing more now. I think you get through the first few get through the first few months of the pandemic and you just pulled in there and you try to do your best. Um, and then as it wears on the isolation and your needs just don't go away and it gets harder and harder. So we're seeing a lot more people who have mental health needs, including people who have developmental disabilities. A great deal of that is due to the isolation. People are feeling more anxious. There's depression. We're, um, more people are coming to us uh, with suicidal ideation, and there have been a number of suicides. And people who kind of had got their, had their lives pretty much together and had stability in their lives, they've lost that stability. Um, they've lost jobs, they've lost social connections, um, they've lost being out in the community. Um, so just kind of this general loss of stability. And so we are now seeing, and we didn't see this initially, more people going to hospital emergency rooms, a greater demand for inpatient services, and the crisis beds that we have around the state are full. Um, some of them have people waiting to access those crisis beds, which is the alternative to uh, needing inpatient care. Um, one agency said this week that they have two to three times more calls to the crisis line now than they did um, before. So um, there's a lot of uh, folks who need support now. Um, and some of that also has to do with substance use. Um, when people are under strain, there's, there's definitely a greater um, incidence of substance use disorders going on. People, um, you know, it it's, helps people get through tough times, but it doesn't really help in the end. Um, also homelessness is a growing problem. So, um, and we have, I'm sorry to say we have wait lists for outpatient services. And I'm also hearing that other providers out there um, have not been as accessible to people in need of service as uh, would be helpful. So there's a, just a general strain on the ability to meet people's needs. Um, where I think, where we seem to be doing okay is um, people in our residential programs are, are faring okay. People who use therapy and I think 
um, Deborah's survey shows that more people are, are continuing to be able to access therapy uh, through online process, but it's a lot harder to get case management services that way. You really can't go look at an apartment online um, as well and get some, that kind of ongoing support from your case manager um, online as you um, could with therapy. So that's, that's a little harder. Also, some people just have poor coverage. They can't access um, the internet. Um, and not everyone has great phones. Um, and there are people who um, have been kind of semi-homeless and don't have permanent housing and it's hard for us to find them and, and support them. Um, and so some, it feels like some people like that are just falling through the cracks. Um, we know that at least 15 to 25% of the people we serve really would like more face-to-face -face interactions. Um, and social interactions, and um, we can't always do that. Employment is obviously very hard because uh, not all employers are able to um, offer employment. Um, we've got a number of, of youth kids who are having um, behavior challenges. They, you know, just like, you know, everyone being home all day with your family is not necessarily a good thing for every child. Um, and they're, they're, again, they're isolated. Um, some of the kids that we serve who are high school age, they're, it's hard to keep those connections with them. Uh, most of our home providers for people with developmental disabilities have been able to keep things going, but we've also lost a few because a number of them had never signed up to do a 24 seven service. Um, others are like, well, I can't go to work, at least I can do this. So it's varied about how people have responded to that. So that's kind of like where we're at. And then back to the, the, the legislative and political stuff, um, looking forward, well, actually I'm gonna stay, let me stay where I am right now. We, we did get, because we got good support from government, we have been able to keep services forward. But as the governor is gonna come back and um, propose a new budget for the rest, for the full fiscal year, the budget instructions were for all agencies and departments to cut budgets by 5%. That could change. Um, that's just where we're at now. So um, if, we, if they change the rules so that uh, $250 million that they set aside from the federal dollars can be used to uh, backfill lost state revenues, they will, and it's possible the rules could change. There's also more federal dollars that could be coming. Um, the House and the Senate are looking at between one trillion and three trillion dollars going back out to um, the country, and we don't know exactly for what. Um, there'll be a new revenue estimate in mid-August, and we don't know if it's going up or down. Um, and then when we look at the agency budget and the services for people with disabilities, what happens with Medicaid is really important. So for the, there has been an increased match of federal dollars for each state dollar, and that's going to be extended for three more months. So that's good news when they're looking at cutting the agency of human services budget. If we have more federal dollars coming in, that will cushion that blow a little. But we really don't know. And so there'll be... Um, reconvening the end of August and by the end of September, they hope to have a full year budget approved and we're, we're not going to know um, much about it until, you know, until we get to the end of August and beginning of September. Um, and their, the revenue projections so far for the year after are much worse than this current year. So that's kind of scary too, that this is not a short term thing. This is a few years that we're going to be dealing with this. Um, so uh, Karen mentioned that there was money put in the budget for hazard pay and it is helpful for people who are direct support professionals. Um, it, it, it's still, there's some, still some holes in it. And then there's this healthcare stabilization grant program that's just opening today and that will help uh, cover added expenses for COVID-19 and address some losses that providers have. Um, and that really runs through September. So what happens after that, I don't know in terms of losses and expenditures. Um, I think Erhard will talk about some of the housing and rental assistance programs. 
Um, the other thing that the legislature did, which was really helpful, is it gave us flexibility. So um, around who's credentialed to provide services, temporary licenses, allowing us to um, use telehealth with, where people only have phones and don't have internet. So you audio only telehealth has been really helpful and they did invest more money in broadband, although I don't know how quickly that will have an impact. Um, and things like uh, if you want to renew a buprenorphine prescription, you don't have to go in person. So all of those flexibilities are there till the end of March. Um, and I, one more thing I do want to mention um, is that there's, they're also looking at public safety. Um, and mental health. And I think you've all heard about proposals to defund the police. Part of that is like, where do we make investments to support public safety? And um, Senate President Tim Ash has proposed um, having mental health workers at state troopers offices, uh, barracks, I should say, not offices. So we've got that going on right now in St. Albans and Bellows Falls and in some, a number of police departments. Um, hopefully that can be expanded. So there'll be a proposal by the administration as required by the legislature to expand that to state troopers um, around the state. And I hope that we'll be able to look at that more broadly about how law enforcement works with people with disabilities, whether it's autism, people in mental health crisis, or people with other needs. Um, can we do more education? Can we have more collaboration? can we figure out kind of who supports people in the best ways? And when someone calls 911, what, what is it that they really need and what's the best way to meet those needs? So that's my quick review. Um, and I hope that um, at the end, folks can let me know if there's um, if you have particular questions. Thanks so much, Julie. Erhard, off to you. So Erhard Manka is coming on as Karen Lafayette, but that's okay. So he's here from the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. Thank you, Erhard. Thanks, Pam, and uh, greetings, everybody. Yeah, there seem to be a lot of Karen Lafayette clones uh, out there today. <laughs> not, a, not a bad person to clone. <laughs> um, and uh, apologies, I uh, was unable to... Uh, zoom in till till just a short while ago uh, and have to uh, apologize for zooming back off again uh, soon after I'm, I'm done. Um, as some of you may know, I'm uh, actually running for Chittenden County Senate, so I'm a little a little busy these days um, with, uh, with a campaign. Um, so thanks for the opportunity, and uh, I did catch Julie's uh, comments uh, about the, the budget, um, so I won't go into that. Let me just zone right in on housing. Uh, so the legislature with the coronavirus relief funds um, and some other CARES Act funds uh, basically allocated $85 million for housing and homelessness. Um, we, during the pandemic, um, we did an amazing job as a state. This is a multi-tiered effort uh, from community partners, community organizations, state agencies. I, I want to just give a shout out to Sarah Phillips at the Office of Economic Opportunity, who was absolutely incredible at this, as, as was uh, Ken Schatz, the uh, uh, DCF commissioner who uh, is just left and just retired um, as, as commissioner. Um, together with our housing agencies and our homeless service providers and community volunteers, we did an amazing job um, housing and keeping safe 2,000 folks uh, across the state, including um, about 400 children uh, that uh, had been previously homeless or precariously housed and doubled up with uh, family and friends and at state expense were housed in motels and provided three meals a day and provided with services. Um, so those folks uh, have started to transition out of those motels and um, part of the funding that was allocated through the coronavirus relief dollars uh, is designed to help folks transition out of motels and uh, hopefully uh, and some will end up back in congregate shelters but basically congregate shelters were not safe places mostly uh, where people uh, could uh, could not physically distance and that was one of the reasons why everybody was moved uh, most people were moved into motels and sh uh, homeless shelters uh, were reduced in terms of the numbers of folks that they uh, the ones that stayed open in terms of the numbers of folks that they they served so um 
and then the other major source of funding was for uh, people who either couldn't pay their mortgage uh, or couldn't pay uh, their rent uh, due to COVID-19 related income losses. So let me just go over kind of the, the funding. Uh, again, that $85 million was broken down into a number of different buckets. Uh, the largest was 25, well actually not quite the largest, but second largest was $25 million for rental assistance and rental arrearages. And I kind of assume that maybe Marilyn's gonna speak a little bit more about this after me. Um, um, because Vermont Legal Aid is uh, very much involved in, the, uh, in, in providing technical assistance for folks to access this, this money. Uh, basically, the $25 million um, applications opened on Monday. Um, so this is for anyone who experienced um, uh, inability to pay their rent. The money, like uh, sec federal Section 8 vouchers or federal Section 8 assistance, would go directly to uh, the landlord uh, to pay on behalf of uh, the tenant who had COVID-related uh, loss, uh, loss of income. It could be for up to, um, and, uh, right up to December 30th, which is the deadline for spending uh, the COVID, uh, the coronavirus relief funds, uh, and starting with uh, rents that were uh, that may have been owed um, starting March March first. The Vermont State Housing Authority is administering these funds, uh, and on their website, uh, which is vsha.org, standing for Vermont State Housing Authority, all the application materials um, and the programmatic materials should be on there. Uh, basically, it's for um, up to, there's, there's no income eligibility limits. The uh, idea is we want to prevent further homelessness through evictions. Um, there is an eviction moratorium that is still in place. It was actually just extended uh, because the governor extended the emergency order to August 15th and the eviction moratorium ends uh, 30 days after that. So no one can be evicted right now in Vermont until September 15th. Uh, that doesn't mean that landlords can't file eviction actions. They can file those, but they're basically stayed until 30 days after uh, the moratorium ends. Uh, and so the concern there is that a large number of evictions um, may be piling up uh, during the moratorium, and that's what this money is for, is to prevent uh, folks from being evicted for non-payment of rent at the end of uh, at the end of the moratorium, uh, and hopefully, you know, being able to do a lot of prevention measures between now and then to uh, pay rent uh, that's already owed and get landlords to agree not to evict uh, folks that that they may have previously been thinking about evicting because of non non payment. Uh, and, and the basic operating principle here is we need to continue to uh, have people need to continue to have homes. Uh, in order to stay safe at home. You can't stay safe at home without a home. And this is also where uh, I think uh, it, we, we just really learned how housing equals healthcare. Without housing, um, people can't be safe at home. And so uh, housing is, is part and parcel of, uh, of, of healthcare. Um, the other um, program uh, that I'll, I'll mention for folks who are home, oh, and by the way, um, uh, mobile homeowners are eligible for um, that, that, that rental assistance as well. So for lot rent and other uh, costs associated uh, with uh, paying for their, their homes so that they don't lose their, their homes. Um, and I'll also say that some of that money will also hopefully go for uh, some of the folks that are currently living in motels uh, for first and last month's rent as well as security deposits uh, to help them get into permanent housing and transition out of uh, motels. Uh, the other um, a uh, large source of uh, funding uh, for mortgage assistance is being, uh, it's $5 million. It's being administered by the Vermont State, uh, excuse me, by the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. And uh, that was unveiled uh, as well um, last uh, Friday at the governor's press conference. I believe the uh, program materials are on their website at VHFA, stands for Vermont Housing Finance Agency, dot O-R-G. Um, and they're providing up to three months worth of mortgage arrearage assistance. Um, the, uh, the eviction moratorium um, that the state passed also extends to mortgages, uh, but even before it was passed, um, most uh, Vermont banks were um, not um, initiating uh, foreclosure action against people who couldn't pay their mortgages due to COVID-19 uh, related income losses. Um, but uh, that being said, uh, there are obviously a lot of folks who have uh, struggled or have been unable to pay their mortgages. And so $5 million is allocated to that, um, that the Vermont Housing Finance Agency is administering. Uh, and they have a, a Monday through Friday hotline uh, for people um, 
with, uh, with, with questions about how that works. Um, the other sources of funding that I'll briefly mention uh, is the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board uh, got a total of $32 million. Uh, $23 million of that is uh, to help uh, nonprofits uh, around the state provide, uh, purchase and uh, quickly renovate uh, transitional housing. Uh, so there will be different solutions that have been um, proposed and, uh, and, and already applied for uh, around the state in some areas, for instance, uh, here in uh, the Chittenden County area, Champlain Housing Trust is purchasing a motel to provide transitional housing for uh, folks that are homeless uh, and to provide um, some renovations and eventually to transform that housing into micro apartments um, for uh, folks with it, without housing. Uh, and there are different solutions in other areas of the state. Uh, some other, um, I think in the Upper Valley, uh, Twin Pines is also looking at purchasing a motel. Uh, in the Bennington area, um, Shires Housing is uh, looking at working with some vacancies at uh, the existing Applegate apartments to house folks. So there are different solutions around the state, and that $23 million is uh, for that, uh, again, with the priority for housing the 2,000 folks that were in motels uh, at, at the peak. Uh, and then uh, VHCB also has $9 million to help upgrade congregate homeless shelters um, so that uh, when some of the folks who are in motels do wind up having to go back to congregate shelters and for the future, um, because the congregate shelters will be with us uh, for a while, um, um, those need to be made uh, safe so that people can uh, physically distance uh, and, and remain safe while uh, housed in, in, in homeless shelters. Um, lastly, uh, well, not quite lastly, but I'll also mention that $16 million of the CRF funds were allocated to the Agency of Human Services to help with the transition for uh, the homeless folks living in motels with a priority on, um, uh, a, a priority on uh, eliminating uh, family homelessness. And so the um, uh, money is uh, going to be in a, a couple of different uh, tranches. Uh, some money will go to expanding the family supportive housing program to provide supports to homeless families. Some of it will go to additional uh, types of rental assistance, uh, short term rental assistance, uh, also uh, expanding the Vermont rental subsidy program, which provides a bridge to a federal Section 8 voucher. Uh, so that $16 million is going to be enhanced by some state general funds. Uh, the total that DCF and OEO are going to be working with is, I think, about $23 million. Um, and there should be, I haven't actually checked, uh, but I, there should be more information on uh, the OEO website, uh, Office of Economic Opportunities website. And I know there have been webinars. Uh, there was uh, one yesterday uh, on um, the rollout of, of some of that assistance for uh, homeless, homeless service providers. Um, and then lastly, I'll, I'll just, and maybe this is a bridge to uh, Marilyn uh, speaking, but um, Vermont Legal Aid got awarded $550,000 to provide eviction prevention um, services, technical assistance, mediation services uh, for tenants to be able to uh, work with their landlords to uh, access uh, that $25 million in rental assistance funds and, and to prevent evictions. Because what we want is we want to make sure that um, no one loses their housing and becomes homeless uh, during the ongoing pandemic, especially if uh, as the parts of the state are experiencing uh, surges and, and uh, as we may experience uh, broader surges um, later this summer or in the fall. Um, lastly, $250,000 was also allocated uh, to uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, and actually all this money, uh, except for um, the uh, VHDB dollars is uh, going through the Department of Housing and Community Development uh, before it goes to the uh, other agencies. So uh, $250,000 is also going to the Repart Vermont Apartment Owners Association and other landlord associations to provide sort of the, the landlord technical assistance to accessing the uh, rental assistance dollars um, and helping um, to prevent uh, homelessness and evictions. So I'll stop there. I uh, hope I haven't um, uh, overused the time allocated to me. I know you guys are tight on, uh, on time. And I also have to apologize in advance that I'm going to have to sign off pretty quickly um, to, uh, uh, to attend to other matters. Thanks very much. And um, we are running 
on time, a little over time actually, but I want to make sure that um, Marilyn Mahusky gets her due and that the other four people who are to follow her are as succinct as we can be so that there's time for questions and answers. Greetings, Marilyn here from Disability Law Project um, with the legislative update. Yes, thank you, Karen or Pam. And uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. I'm here on behalf of Nancy Bryden, who is the director of the Disability Law Project. She couldn't be here today. Um, I am a staff attorney with Vermont Legal Aid's Disability Law Project. Um, boy, Earhart did a great job plugging legal aid. Um, I actually <laughs> had intended to focus my remarks and will um, on special education issues because that's really where I've been focusing my time. But just to sort of follow up briefly with what Earhart said about um, Vermont Legal Aid, we have actually just announced that we've hired five new people, I believe, to, um, relative to the housing money that we've received. We are gearing up to represent people um, it, with eviction actions as we anticipate that once the courts uh, resume scheduling hearings, so as of right now, hearings have not been scheduled, but we anticipate that there's going to be a flurry of activity. So if people need housing assistance, they can um, find us through um, Vermont Help, uh, vermontlawhelp.org. Uh, we've been doing a lot of updating of information on a whole host of COVID related issues. So that's a really good place for folks to go and get resources. And of course, um, you can contact um, Vermont Law Help, which is our sister organization for an intake on any range of issues. But two, special education, uh, yes, I will try to speak up. Sorry, I know I talk softly. Um, special education. So, um, as probably many of you know, the legislature in the last couple of years had passed legislation to overhaul the funding system for special education. Um, that was referred to as Act 173. This is a shift from a reimbursement model for special education expenses to a census-based funding model. Um, as part of that legislation, the um, General Assembly um, organized an advisory group called the Census-Based Funding Advisory Group um, to advise the Agency of Education on rules and other things that would need to be changed relative to this transition. So VCDR is a member of that group. Karen Price from VF, uh, Vermont Family Network is VCDR's representative. Um, and I, on behalf of the Disability Law Project, uh, I'm the other disability advocate on that group. So Karen and I have been very busy the last couple of years. We've been meeting rather regularly. Um, thus far, the agency has proposed rules and presented them to the State Board of Education. The rules primarily focus on the funding issues. So they're proposing a new rule 1300 series, which will be focused on funding. Karen and I were involved in that. Um, we were able successfully to get some significant changes to those rules before they actually were proposed. A big change in that is the, de is the definition of special education services. We were able to get the agency to agree to adopt the federal definition of special education services, which is broader than Vermont's definition and which does not have the limitation that Vermont's definition currently has. So that's a big, um, that's a big change. Along those same lines, we, uh, uh, VFN, Vermont Family Network, along with some other advocacy groups, um, along with the Disability Law Project, we um, did a complete overhaul of the disability, of the special education rules and submitted them to the State Board of Education as part of the rulemaking process and asking them to make um, whole scale changes to the rules. Um, the agency and the rules that they proposed made very few changes, mostly technical in nature. We felt as though Vermont's rules were not consistent with federal law, um, limited the number of children who could qualify for special education. One big thing that I think a lot of folks have been concerned with over the years is the fact that we have a second gate that you need to jump through in order to become eligible for special education. We refer to it as gate two, the adverse effect rule. And we're proposing that that rule be eliminated 
along with some other rules. Um, we also are proposing the adoption of a multi-tiered uh, system of support rule, which was not required by the legislation. Um, the legislature or the State Board of Education held um, scheduled some public hearings. One thing the legislature did was uh, favorably respond to the request that the State Board um, expand the time frame for public comments. So public comments are open um, for special education rulemaking through the end of the year, which is a good thing. So if you and that, that was changed primarily because of COVID. Um, so if you have comments you want to make, you can find the rules on the, on the Agency, of Wed and Agency of Education, the State Board of Education website. Um, and if you have questions, you can talk to me or Karen about that. So other issues that have happened um, because of COVID, um, because of the CARES Act funding, um, money came into Vermont, 32 million came into Vermont for elementary and secondary education. Um, the law project was very busy in advocating with the governor's office, the secretary of the agency of education and others on how that funding should be spent. Um, a, a large portion of the money that came into the state, 90% of it was directed towards the local education agencies. We asked the state to um, uh, pull together a group of stakeholders so that the funds could be used as intended by Congress, which was to direct those funds to um, disadvantaged groups, uh, historically disadvantaged groups, including children with disabilities. So there were tw 12 permitted purposes. Um, the agency didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to that, uh, but we're still pushing for accountability and transparency on how that funding is being used. But one thing of importance for kids with disabilities is that there specifically is an option for access to assistive technology, uh, connectivity, um, other kinds of adaptive equipment. So we think it's really important that if children need have those needs, they should be talking to their local school boards. Um, we also have done advocacy with the agency on the guidance that they've put out regarding special education. We think that some of the guidance conflicts with the federal law. So we've been advocating with them relative to their guidance and asking that they change that consistent with federal law. Um, my colleague Rachel Seelig and I did a town hall on Vermont Legal Aid's website, which you can look at and listen to on special education. Karen Price and I are doing a webinar later um, this month on transition back to school for students with disabilities. So people will have a couple opportunities to kind of be brought up to speed with what's happening um, in the schools as we go forward. Obviously, that um, remains to be seen how schools are going to open in the fall. The last bit of um, the other aspect that happened in the legislature is the Special Ed Advisory Council um, has been, um, I, I believe, expanded. And part of that advocacy around that was was to comply with the requirements of the law, which is to expand the number of people who have disabilities or parents of disabilities or disability advocates um, so that there's greater representation on that special ed advisory council. My colleague, Rachel Seelig, is now the, um, uh, the director of that. I'm losing the term. Um, but anyway, that's a good thing. I think that Rachel's um, really capable and competent and I think will make a difference in terms of our special ed advocacy. And the last thing I really wanted to mention, because I know my time is, is short and there are other people who are waiting to speak, um, is as a result of the murder of George Floyd, we, have re we are resuming our efforts to uh, advocate for the removal of school resource officers and for the elimination of dis um, disciplinary exclusion. Uh, the L law project um, wrote an open letter to all the school boards in the state, all the superintendents in the state. We copied the Agency of Education. We copied ed legislators. We are calling along with other um, advocates, the Human Rights Commission, the ACLU, NAACP, um, Racial Justice Vermont, or the Racial Justice Alliance calling for um, the, the removal of SROs and to change the practices. We know in the Disability Law Project that students with disabilities and students of color are disproportionately impacted by having police in our schools. 
Uh, we know that it has long-term consequences for students with disabilities. We have represented those students who've been arrested for disability-related behavior and referred to juvenile justice. Uh, we know that's happening with students of color disproportionately to their numbers in our schools. So that's become a big initiative that we're focusing on currently. Um, so I think other than to just finally say that we, again, to reiterate, we don't know what's going on with schools reopening. The Census-Based Funding Advisory Group is meeting again in early August. Karen and I will both be participating in that meeting and we're hoping the agency will be able to provide us with some more information. So I hope that's a, <laughs> a quick summary um, and I'll be you know, happy to answer any questions when that time comes. So thank you again for including me. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Now we're moving into the programs and resources part of the agenda and each of us four speakers was to have 10 minutes, but I'm realizing that's going to shorten our time considerably in terms of questions and answers. So um, for those of us who are next up, if we're able to be as concise as possible to leave some time for Q&A at the end, I truly appreciate it, but don't want to cut you short. Zachary, you get to be the first person in the list from Disability Rights Vermont. Um, I'm going to let you go. Great, thanks so much. Um, okay, I'll try to be brief. I am I've been asked to talk about sort of Disability Rights Vermont, what we do generally and what we offer and um, sort of how we're operating now during this strange time that we find ourselves in. So um, quick sort of overview of who we are. We are part of the um, National Protection and Advocacy Network. We are a private nonprofit um, organization we are essentially sort of a nonprofit law firm. We exist to advocate and promote and expand the rights of people with disabilities. We have um, myself and several other attorneys in the office and we have several non-attorney advocates as well. Um, so that is generally sort of who we are. What we do generally is um, quite broad. I generally tell people, um, if you think that we can help you, when in doubt, give us a call and um, you know, chances are we can probably help. And if not, we can refer you to who, who can. Um, and even if we can't help, it's helpful for us to know sort of what issues people with disabilities are having so we can sort of try to focus on um, common themes on a systemic level as well as working on individual cases. Um, so some of the things that we sort of common, typically more commonly work on um, include things like uh, we mostly focus on abuse and neglect. And so any instances in the community or in any facilities, including prisons, hospitals, any care facilities, if there's instances of abuse or neglect, we can investigate and advocate in those situations. Um, we also have a program called the Communication Support Project, which works to um, assist individuals with communication issues in legal proceedings other than criminal court. Um, and that project is, is still running, um, you know, mostly the way it was before, but obviously now with different uh, precautions in place for safety, um, assisting with a lot of remote hearings and court proceedings. Um, and when in and going into court when when that does occur, um, and just trying to keep physical distancing and, and wearing masks and things. Um, we also do work in prisons with rights in there. Um, we go, we frequently go to and monitor and investigate concerns and do outreach in hospitals and other treatment facilities. Um, we do a lot of work related to people who are stuck in hospitals um, for reasons unrelated to their care, as in they no longer need to be in the hospital for treatment, but for various reasons they are stuck there and unable to leave. Um, we also work on employment and housing discrimination and issues, and that includes helping people get reasonable accommodations in the workplace and at home. We also help with uh, voting assistance and access to voting. We also um, you know, help with, with the census as well, and another plug for getting the census completed. Um, and then we also provide services to victims of crimes, and those services include assisting folks throughout the criminal process, as well as helping people get um, relief from abuse orders and other um, potential you know, issues and ways we can help with, with issues related to the criminal, um, you know, being a survivor of a crime. Um, 
Let's see what else. We also uh, provide assistance to individuals receiving Social Security Administration benefits who are experiencing barriers to employment. Um, and so that's an interesting piece of work we do because the issue doesn't have to be disability related. Obviously, we are disability rights once we focus on disability issues, but under that um, particular program, it doesn't have to be a disability issue. That's the barrier. As long as the individual has a disability, receives benefits, and they're having a barrier to employment. We also assist people with um, rep payee issues. If they're getting Social Security benefits, and they have a a rep payee and they're having issues with that, we can possibly assist there. And we also do reviews of um, rep payees to make sure that, that they're working appropriately and providing for all their beneficiaries. Um, so that's a quick overview of some things that we do, but we cover a lot more than that. And I'm sure I, I forgot a few things, but again, when in doubt, give us a call. Um, now during the pandemic, we are operating, you know, we're still doing all the same work that we did before. We're just doing it you know, using, um, you know, more remote communication, more physical distancing, and we're not really in our office that much. Uh, we do have a few folks going, going into the office periodically. Um, we try to have a live person there to answer the phone as much as possible. Um, but for all of us that are working remotely, we are checking emails and checking phone messages regularly. And we're working just as much as we, as we were before, if not more on, on occasion. Um, so that's sort of a quick overview of, of what we do and how we're operating these days. And I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards if uh, there are questions. Thank you, Zachary. I appreciate it. It was concise and very clear and, and lots of good information. Next up is Julie Tamler from the Inclusion Center. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yes. So hello, thank you so much for, uh, for having us. So Inclusion Center, for those who don't know, is a drop-in activity center and it's by and for people with disabilities, uh, people with health issues and anybody else who wants to join us. And pre-COVID, we were meeting Mondays and Fridays, nine to two. People would drop in and whoever comes in would basically decide what we're going to do. So we have people who are interested in advocacy, people who are interested in art, making movies, dance, and we would just go with, um, with the people's interests. Um, so for, let's see, so we were making movies. Um, some of them were educational. Some of them were just silly. They were used as PSAs on the local uh, TV, BCTV. And um, we would have presentations. We met with the police. We met with the Women's Crisis Center, the town manager. Pretty much every week, we had a new person from the community come in and talk with us. And the point for us was to learn from them, but also for them to learn about disability. We wanted them to, to understand that we're humans. And so we would talk about our different issues and our um, health concerns, our disabilities and so on, and answer their questions as well as them um, you know, teaching us. So let's see, we've also done things like we had a mastectomy party for a woman who was having a double mastectomy. And so it was a very big deal for her, of course. And because we are a very uh, loving community and a very silly community, we knew that this would be very fun for her. So we had a party, we, had, we made tassels um, and we laughed a lot and she went into surgery with the tassels on and she gave some tassels to her surgeon as well. And so it changed her entire experience. We had a, um, a wheelchair party for a woman who um, was going from, from walking to using a wheelchair. And she was having a very difficult time with it, of course. So we had an obstacle course set up and we had wheelchair races. So I'm just telling you all of this to give you an idea of um, you know, of who we are and how we function. So right now we are on uh, Zoom 
and we're meeting three times a week on Zoom. We used to have about 30 people, now we're down to about 20. Um, and when we made the transition, a lot of people didn't know how to do Zoom. A lot of people didn't have um, um, you know, iPads or computers or anything. So we went to the community, we got donations of technology and also tech support. So we were able to get uh, 20, 20 of us on, and it's been going pretty well. Um, so we meet two hours on Mondays. We meet, we talk, we support each other. We then do improv, improvisation, and on Tuesdays we have Conversation Cafe. So we're having quite serious conversations. Um, about topics, well, that we choose. And then on Fridays, we play games and talk. And if there are people who come in and who want to do art, we would set up um, a session for art and we could have a book club and, you know, whatever it is that people want, we have it set up this way right now because that's who's showing up. Um, I think I, I can leave it at that to be very brief. So we are very interested in everybody joining us from across the state. Right now we have people from Massachusetts. We have one person from New York, um, certainly New Hampshire, and then the rest of us are from Vermont. But this would be a wonderful way to connect with people all across the state, all across the country for that matter. Um, we are free and um, and people could just connect with, with me and we would go from there. Julie, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And, and we are galloping along, so we're gonna have some time hopefully at the end still. Um, Peter Jonke from the Vermont Center for Independent Living, um, your turn. I'm glad to be here to uh, just give you an update from VCIL. Um, as most everybody has in indicated, um, we're all doing our, our work very differently, which is true for VCIL as well. Um, we um, are not r routinely seeing any peers in any offices. Um, there are a few exceptions to that, and those are by appointment. None of our offices are open to the public. Um, we do, um, especially in our Montpelier office, we have a few staff rotating through there um, for various tasks that are difficult to do remotely. Um, but what I really wanted to focus on are some specific things um, around COVID and just a reminder of a few other things uh, that BCAL has been doing for a long time. As uh, uh, Commissioner Hutt had said, um, there was a big increase um, in uh, providing meals for individuals and um, BCAL has for many years been doing Meals on Wheels for people under 60 years old with disabilities and because of their disability, they're unable to cook. Um, so that was expanded in a couple of ways. Typically, uh, those meals were five days a week. And so it was expanded to six to seven days a week. And then we also further expanded the program. Uh, so that it, if people with disability have access to food because either no transportation or they were confined to their home or whatever the situation was. Um, so then uh, we also added them to the Meals on Wheels program. Um, and in some situations, uh, we were also able um, either to use that as a bridge and until we could get up, get some delivery services set up. Um, some of those deliveries were done by our advocates in different parts of the state. Some of them we connected the uh, peers with other organizations that were able to do that. Um, so that's um, uh, been an ongoing project. One thing we're exploring uh, logistically, it may be we still have to sort of figure out some logistics. Um, we're exploring the feasibility of trying to help people use um, some of the food delivery services. Um, but it's a little tricky there because um, the cost involved depends on the cost of the grocery so it's not a flat fee um, each time and um, you know typically those would be paid you know with a debit card or a credit card and 
So we're just trying to uh, work through that process as an example. And remind people of, um, of course, at the at the uh, biggest uh, height of the pandemic in Vermont, pretty much everything was shut down. And now things are opening up again, including our Vermont Interpreter Referral Service, uh, also referred to as VIRS. Um, not to be com confused with the Vermont IRS, <laughs> some people do that, but it's the Vermont Interpreter Referral Service. Um, and um, they uh, will connect um, mostly businesses, healthcare professionals. Uh, occasionally we get calls from individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing who need uh, certified interpreters, uh, but don't know how to, how to make that connection. And so through that program, those connections are being made. And so they have started uh, their their uh, requests have been picking up in the last few weeks. Um, the other program that we've been doing for quite a while is called the Equipment Distribution Program. It's through the state of Vermont, through the Public um, Services uh, Department, um, and it provides telephone equipment um, to people who can't access uh, a regular uh, telephone conversation because of a disability. And this can be all kinds of different adapted phones. Uh, sometimes it may involve a laptop with certain kinds of software. Um, and the reason I mentioned this program in particular, uh, although we have done a lot of outreach, it's the most underutilized program we have. Um, and there is money still available in that program. Typically, um, you always have a greater need than the money you have. Um, this particular program has been the opposite of that. So. Um, and there's all kinds of really interesting technology if you have somebody who has um, a uh, cognitive disability and can't remember names or those kinds of things, you can get a phone that has pictures of people they want to call. And so they'll see the picture of the person and they know, oh, that's the button they need to push to connect for an automatic dial to that individual. And that's just one example of just a wide variety of things. So. Uh, we partner a lot with the assistive technology projects across the state to help figure out the right equipment for that. And um, also, um, what Earhart mentioned um, through the Vermont um, Housing Finance Agency about the mortgage um, assistance program, also called MAP. We do have a partnership with the Housing Finance Agency so that if people need assistance, um, in filling out those applications, um, our advocates um, are prepared to do that. Um, and so uh, the, they would call our regular number uh, and connect with our intake person. And then um, we would they would be connected with the advocate in the air, their area for assistance in filling out um, those applications. Um, and. Um, the one thing I should probably add about that program that I think is important for people to know is uh, applications can, can be made until August 31st, and um, they're collecting all the applications before they distribute any money. So it's not a first come, first serve. Uh, then what they're going to do is prioritize um, the applications so that the people who are at most risk of losing their homes get served first until you know all the money runs out basically so there even if you apply there's no guarantee that you will get um, you know uh, funded uh, even if you're the first to apply um, but they're hopeful they can serve as many people as possible although they anticipate they won't have enough money to get through the whole process um, which brings me to a new program that VCI has just launched Sort of did, did a soft launch this week. Uh, we will be doing a lot more outreach on it. We call it our RISE Fund, R-I-S-E, which stands for uh, Resilience to Independence During a State of Emergency. Um, and the simplest way to explain this fund, and we, we named it this so it doesn't get confused with any of our other funding programs that we've had for a long time, like the Sue Williams Freedom Fund, um, and others, um, but the easiest way to explain this is if you need a thing or a piece of equipment um, or a temporary service, um, anything like that, that was specifically 
you need this specifically because of COVID-19, uh, then I would say call us. Um, we can help sort out whether your request would qualify under the grant parameters of this uh, program. Um, it's fairly broad, uh, but it does, uh, there are three main criteria um, for actually, I mean, the one first one uh, umbrella thing is you have to have a person with a significant disability. And then the other ones are the uh, whatever is needed must be COVID related. It must be necessary and it has to be of reasonable cost. So um, I'll leave it at that, uh, but don't hesitate to call us. Um, we ask when people call, uh, you'll get voicemail. Please leave voicemail because, as I said, we have limited staff in the office. But all those voicemails, um, uh, we have somebody monitoring that, and they show up in email. And so uh, we can respond quite quickly um, to those uh, voicemail messages that are left. Um, I just found out today, um, just uh, from one of our advocates in our uh, advocate in Brattleboro for our Deaf Independence Program, um, that the uh, Vermont Recovery Network um, is starting a um, uh, group, a virtual group for the deaf and hard of hearing, and there will be interpreters involved with that. And I will put the link to get information of that in the chat as soon as I'm off uh, with my presentation. Um, and also, uh, we will be getting the word out. We haven't set a date yet, but it will probably be in the next week or so. We're waiting to confirm interpreters, but we're going to do a, a virtual celebration for the um, uh, passage of the ADA. Um, you know, this being the, I believe it's the 30th anniversary. Um, and we're just inviting people to, we'll have a two hour session and we're inviting people just to share their experiences about what the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, has meant for them. Um, you don't have to you know, be there for the whole two hours. Obviously, if you want to listen to other people's experiences, that'd be great. Um, but if you just have a few minutes to connect at some point, you can chime in, you can connect and uh, share your, your experiences. And so we'll be getting more information out about that as soon as we have a, have a date set on that. Um, so that's uh, all I have to share, and I'll be here for questions, and I'll post that link in the chat in just a moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. You did Sarah and Vermont Center for Independent Living proud. I am in the unfortunate position of being the last one, so I'm going to try to make my remarks concise, and then we can have some time for questions and answers. Um, as I said at the beginning, um, I am the president and CEO of Vermont Family Network, and we're a statewide family support and advocacy organization that um, empowers and supports families of children with special needs throughout the state of Vermont. Um, we generally serve about 1,200 families and 150 professionals a year. We do this through support, information, and connection. And we're unique in that we, um, most of our staff are themselves parents of children with a variety of disabilities and special health needs in our family support work that we do. Um, we also have the Puppets in Education program, um, which serves well beyond Vermont's borders and um, is doing a lot of work, particularly around um, reducing anxiety for children lately and helping um, promote inclusion and understanding of disability, which is how they came to be under our umbrella a couple of years ago. Um, we currently also have the largest early intervention program um, for the state of Vermont for infants and toddlers in Chittenden County. That program is going to be moving to Northwestern Counseling and Support Services as of um, September 1st as a, a victim of payment reform, which is too long a story for me to talk about today. But that said, um, as a result of COVID-19, we've been working remotely since um, the middle of March. All of our staff are consistently available to families and um, our puppets programs have uh, resorted to some very creative video presentations, which are available on our website to support families um, whose children are experiencing um, anxiety as a result of the COVID-19 isolation that they're experiencing. We also did a collaborative um, presentation with the Vermont Children's Hospital to support children um, 
who are home now who may be experiencing abuse. So to give them some connection and some ability to report if they needed to do that or to speak to trusted adults. Our family to family support work is the primary work that we're doing. And we're finding a real uptick right now as a result of COVID in um, our helpline calls. So we have experienced uh, parents who are answering those calls and helping families navigate special education of which Marilyn spoke quite a bit. And obviously it's extremely complicated now that families are trying to decide whether they want to send their children back to school or continue to navigate um, the types of remote learning that their children have been doing. Oftentimes there are concerns about special health needs and vulnerability of those children going back into school environments. So we're really trying to help families understand their options to understand their rights and the procedural safeguards around these types of choices and to really be a bridge between schools and the medical system and disability resources and the families themselves. We're also doing a lot of work with youth in transition and um, we actually have a couple of really great opportunities coming up. There's going to be an interactive special education workshop with Dr. Jackie Kelleher who works for the Agency of Ed um, coming up on August 14th and then a youth summit workshop for youth with disabilities that's happening on August 19th and that information is on our website. Um, we have done a number of town halls with um, partners like the Disability Law Project and the Children with Special Health Needs Division at the Vermont Department of Health, as well as um, Developmental Disabilities Council and um, the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living um, Dis Developmental Services, which have um, helped families look at how they might um, receive more resources, including being paid as caregivers for um, their children who are home and cannot receive PCA or nursing supports right now. So that's been a great boon. And we've been really glad to partner in communicating with families about um, how they can receive those supports and understanding um, the parameters around them. We're doing a lot of parent-to-parent -parent matching um, to really help experienced parents, help parents who are new in diagnoses or new in navigating systems figure out how to do that more effectively. We've been doing, um, since the beginning of the shutdown, a lot of COVID-19 frequently asked questions for the population that we serve. And all of that is posted on our website as well and is a great resource. Uh, we have been really trying to help the Nepali and Bhutanese families that we work with through our uh, family support person who is from that community understand um, what's going on with COVID-19 and how to access uh, telehealth in this time. We've been doing that with families who, for whom English is first language as well and are moving more in that direction. Um, we've been uh, what was I was going to say? I apologize. The town halls I mentioned and family forums and coffee chats have also been happening to support families who've been increasingly isolated during the COVID times. And we also have had some pools of flexible funding that we've been able to help families um, utilize to support unexpected expenses um, during the time that there's been job loss or other pressures in their families that are COVID related. So I would refer folks to our website, which is vermontfamilynetwork.org, or our Facebook page, or our family Facebook page, which is a closed site for families of kids with disabilities and special health needs, which is a great parent-to-parent -parent support resource now, as well as our Vermont Leadership Series, um, which we're trying to recruit new folks for and think about doing in a creative and virtual way this year. So um, I'm really happy to have had the opportunity to share a little bit about what we're doing and the support information and connection that my organization provides in collaboration with a lot of partners um, here at the Coalition for disability rights as well as beyond those and our state partners. So without further ado, I think we're going to move into our question and answer section for which we have about 15 minutes left. I want to be respectful of everybody's time and allow you to unmute and ask questions as you will. If nobody feels like they want to start that, I'm going to let um, Stephanie ask some of the questions that were in the chat box. So the floor is yours. Hi there. Um, yes, there were some questions asked in the chat box, but I believe they were all answered um, already. So, 
okay, that's helpful. That buys us a little more time too. Mm -hmm. So are there questions from our wonderful audience? This is Tim Bradshaw from the um, public transit section of VTrans. Um, I just wanted to mention if anyone has um, any challenges with transportation, access to transportation, um, feel free to, to contact me and I'm avail available at any time to talk to you because maybe there's some options that you haven't thought about as far as accessing, accessing transportation. And I can give you some information on our Go Vermont website as well as um, the local transit providers that might be able to assist you with your transportation needs. Thank you, Tim. That's really helpful. Uh, this is Ed Paquin from Disability Rights Vermont. And maybe this is a question for Tim. Um, as he was speaking, it occurs to me that uh, um, we get questions from people with disabilities uh, about barriers to voting. And uh, it's, it's come up internally uh, to ask ourselves the question, could there be free public transportation on election day? What kind of a practical uh, uh, impediments to that would there be? Yeah, sure. I, th I think that uh, some of the transit providers have offered that before on some of their fixed route services throughout the state. Um, not necessarily like demand response uh, dollar ride services, but if someone is close to the fixed route services that are available, um, they offer like free, free ride vouchers for people to get them, get them to the voting polls. But I can certainly give you some more information about that if you'd like. That's great. Thank you so much. Other questions? Hi, this is Sin Smith. So I was one wondering if the uh, Department of Dale was doing any more consideration as our state of emergency continues to be extended around supporting family members who are caring for their family members at home. I'm sure that's for Monica. <laughs> Hi, Sin. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, we are uh, trying to figure it out as we go along. It's a you know different budget picture right now as with this first quarter budget. I think certainly our hope is to continue to be as flexible as possible. I, one of the things that we were able to do pretty successfully was to allow for some flexing within people's service plans and hopefully that can still happen. We're, we are figuring it out though and actually as Pam mentioned, I think we've already got some more forums scheduled. I don't know if we've, I'm not sure if we're doing that through you, Pam, or if we're doing that separately, but I know we're, I know I've got time held on my calendar already for some more town hall meetings so that we can, as soon as we have information, we can share it out with families. So stay tuned. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thanks for asking, Sin. Thank you, Monica. Of course. Uh, this is Stephanie. There's a question in the, the chat box. Uh, I don't know who might know. Does anyone know how many people residing within Vermont have disabilities or are blind or deaf? Oh, and I see that Ed is responding about 125,000. Thank you, Ed. I have a question. Um, Go ahead, Kara. You, okay. Um, Sorry, I'm wearing a mask because there's cigarette smoke in my apartment from neighbors. No worries. <laughs> um, so, uh, is there anything being done about um, the EBT issue of that we we can't use um, EBT uh, on like Instacart or anything like that? Um, and like I have a a screenshot here where um, if you have EBT cash. Um, you can't use it on Amazon. You can only use EBT food. And on walmart.com, you can pay with EBT food or cash, but there's no delivery in Vermont. So there's no, literally no way to use EBT cash benefits if you can't leave your apartment. <laughs> um, and you can't transfer it to, a, a, you know, your bank account. Um, I always have to find a, some, somebody to, you know, take my uh, EBT card and my 
bank card and, you know, and pins and everything and go running around. Is there any way to like fix that? So this, I don't know if there's a state official there who might know the answer, but this is Marilyn Mahusky. I see the question is uh, also what's EBT? I'm oh, not sorry. Um, uh, basically food stamps. Right. I was going to say, I, I don't know what the actual EBT, electronic benefits transfer maybe means, but it's yes, basically the electronic ATM type card for people receiving um, assistance from SNAP or food stamps. I, I don't know the answer to your question, but I would suggest that you contact Legal Aid. Um, if you get in touch with our, you know, Vermont Law Help, um, vtlawhelp.org, there may be people on staff who, if they don't know the answer to that question, can at least try and figure out whether there is a remedy, is there, if there's a way to fix that problem for you, okay? That's my suggestion. I, I wish I knew more, but I don't. And Marilyn, I would say it's not the Kara, first I come up, so I'm glad to, to hear you raise it. Mm -hmm. Monica, do you have any further information about that from your position as commissioner? I don't. As Kara was saying that, I was kind of mouthing to myself, well, that's a really good question. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure that we could ask, though, Pam, uh, Sean Brown, Mm -hmm. who was named the new commissioner at the Department for Children and Families and the EBT program still sits in that department. Um, so we should definitely just ask him that question because the intent I think was certainly to make it easier for food delivery to happen. Um, and that's obviously not working. This is Deborah. That, that I'm happy to follow, follow up with Sean Brown. Karen, you're breaking up. Karen Lafayette, the real Karen Lafayette. I'm hearing her say she's happy to take this up. No, to I, had, I had to get off. I had to get off. I had to get off my other computer. So I'm happy to follow up, but I didn't hear Kara's complete question. So if you can, Kara, if you can just send me a quick email with with that 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 issue, I'll I'll follow up with Sean Brown. Did you hear that? Yes, thank you. <laughs> right. Thanks. Sorry. Another great advantage to bringing everybody together is that um, together we're stronger and we're able to get some answers sometimes that we might not have otherwise and think of the questions that we might not have otherwise. So um, we're seeing the chat box, I believe EBT stands for Electronic Benefits Transfer. From what I remember in my old state job, I would say that is correct. <laughs> so. Other questions in the last few minutes we have? I have a question. Hi, everyone. This is Hi, Mary. Mary. This is Mary from Disability Rights Vermont. Um, as many of you know, um, and hopefully all will know soon, um, as we'll be helping publicize the efforts by the Secretary of State's office, um, the Secretary of State is rolling out a new vote at home accessibility option. Um, which would allow an individual to receive their ballot um, via a, a computer or tablet, you know, via technology, allow that person to use whatever technology that they um, use, uh, typically, to complete that ballot and then print the ballot out for returning to your town or city clerk's office. Um, that all sounds great. It's a step forward. However, many people do not have access to the technology to either in-home computer, tablet, or particularly to printers to be able to uh, utilize that. And I'm wondering about resources, aside from we're thinking public libraries, if people can even get to them, if they're even open, but other resources, ideas that people have um, that are on this uh, webinar today around um, helping people access the technology needed to use that option. Do people think? Uh, this is uh, Peter at the Vermont Center for Independent Living. Um, I didn't actually introduce myself completely. I'm the deputy director there. Um, I would have to um, figure out with our, um, for our Montpelier office, I, I, it would be very difficult in our branch offices um, it might be possible in our Bennington office. Um, 
but um, we may be able to set up uh, a process where uh, we could safely social distance and um, provide um, a printer. We do have a public access computer there already. Um, so that, that might be a possibility. I would have to, I, I don't want to make promises to anybody, but I'm glad you brought it up because I had heard similar complaints. Um, hopefully moving forward for, you know, elections, you know, certainly probably won't happen by the time of the general election, but uh, in the future, uh, there will be the capacity to actually cast that ballot online. Uh, it's just, it's a, the system does exist. It, it exists already in Washington, D.C., and it may in other places, but that's one place I know it exists. Um, and um, I'll, I'll definitely, if, if we do set something up, um, I will definitely make sure we get the word out to people. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, and I do see a question related to that. Um, I thought everyone was going to get a mail-in ballot um, that says in the chat. And um, I, I'm wondering, Ed, um, if maybe you could speak to that, because there are different uh, procedures happening that are in place right now. Um, sure. Everyone who is registered and is living in the address, at the address where they are registered, should get for the primary, should have gotten for the primary, a postcard that you can send in, fill out the back and send in to get a ballot sent to you to vote in the primary. The idea being they would like as few people as necessary to have to actually go to a polling place. And then for the general election, everyone who has a current address at which they are registered, those uh, folks will all get automatically the ballot on which you will vote. So it's just like getting the old uh, early voting or absentee ballot, whichever term you want to use. There are other kinds of accommodations. If you decide to go to the polls, you can go and there's a tablet there, which I tried out myself. It's not a difficult thing. Um, if for some reason uh, the paper ballot does not work well for you. Um, so uh, the, the one to be filled out at home um, and, and sent in, at this point, the, I would say it is definitely um, an option for some who are well equipped with the technology, but if you don't have a printer, it's not of, it's not of use. And, you know, if it's going to be uh, difficult to arrange getting to another place, then I would say go to the polls and use the tablet there because um, that's a, it's a pretty accessible uh, uh, piece of equipment. So there's a lot of, there are other different ways. Your own town clerk will answer how, if there are peculiarities to the way your town is setting up uh, uh, voting this time. But uh, definitely our message to the disability community is get out there and vote. If you have barriers, call people like Disability Rights Vermont or Vermont Center for Independent Living, but you got to vote. No excuses, folks. There is a way to do it. You know, people will help you do it if we, if we have to. Um, we really want participation from the disability community because our voice has been underrepresented over time. And it's on us to get out there and to make our voices heard. Uh, there's been some interesting research done that if you look at the number of people with disabilities in particular areas who do and don't vote or who did not vote in the 2016 election, regardless of which party you looked at, if those people have voted, the numbers were great enough to have swung significant election blocks. We have more power than we use. So I'll preach to anybody. Um, yes, there's great accommodations out there, if you need to learn about them, get in touch with either Disability Rights Vermont, Secretary of State, Vermont Center for Independent Living, probably any other organization that's on this, uh, this group right now. Um, but you got to vote, folks. 
And this is Peter uh, from the Vermont Center for Independent Living again. And just to echo uh, Ed's point, please do get out and vote. Um, but just uh, to make it very clear, if you either didn't get a postcard because you may have moved or you lost it or it got buried in other mail, um, you don't have to have a postcard. You can just call the town clerk and ask for a ballot and you will get one. And this is Tim from Public Transit again. Um, I do want to also mention that uh, public transit is fare free at this time. Um, so you can access access our services for free. Uh, we just ask that, you know, right now that they're requiring um, people to wear masks on these public transit services. Well, I'm realizing that we have come to the three o'clock hour in our conversation about programs and advocacy during the pandemic. Um, we could probably do this all day, honestly. There's, there's so much information to be shared, and we so appreciate the insight and the questions from the people that chose to come to this meeting today. Um, really, really are very appreciative. And I want to thank Stephanie and Karen Lafayette and Sarah Launderville and Ed Paquin and many of the other presenters who were here today and the people that helped put this together. Um, it's, it's a real opportunity to connect and to collaborate. Um, I'm glad that we're leaving on the note of please vote. Your voices do matter and nothing about us without us is more important now than ever. So I encourage people to reach out if you need any support around that or any other things, COVID related or not. Um, we are here for you and for your families and we truly appreciate your time today. Um, this uh, Zoom is going to be uh, put up as a recording on our website, probably within the next couple of days. Stephanie just texted me and said that that is coming. Um, also, if you didn't get the materials or want materials that you saw today, like the PowerPoint, um, we would be happy to share those. So I wanna thank you all again and wish you a very wonderful weekend. And uh, please reach out to us if you would like to be part of the Coalition for Disability Rights. We're always looking for new members. Thank you very much.